the Bahamas has many environmental treasures, but research and conservation are critical. So we're going to tell you a little bit more about that and share the experiences of some young people in this edition of The Read Factor. The fourth Bahamas Natural History Conference will take place in March at the Bahama Resort. Now the theme for it will be Pathways to Conservation. And we're going to tell you why conservation and research is so critical to help me do that. We have Shelley Kant, Woodside, who is Director of Science and Policy at the Bahamas National Trust. And Vanessa Haley Benjamin, the Chief Scientist at Bahama. Welcome. Thank you. It's great. Now, uh, very exciting time. This is the fourth one, mm -hmm. but um, a little bit different this time. What's going to be the um, uh, focus of this one, um, Pathways to Conservation? Yeah, well, the theme this year is Pathways to Conservation. So understanding that to achieve true conservation, it actually takes many things to happen. Not only do we need to have the right research in place, but it has to also inform policy. Also, we need to have the human population also um, considered as a part of it. So the whole theme of the conference is trying to bring together all these different players um, to help start that dialogue about how do we actually get conservation in the Bahamas. We need to, you know, um, educate the people. We know that. That's a very important aspect. We need to also educate the, the policy makers and have them come on board as well as do the correct research so we know what we're doing. And it's going to be held at Bahamar. Yes, and, and this is really a big step forward, right? We have another major resort, um, but also embracing the need to um, have real conservation and to get involved in research. Exactly. That's why I love the theme that it's being held on because Bahamar and the <coughs> Bahamar Foundation playing such a major role in it, that's critical. I mean, in addition to researchers and conservationists, you need private sector. So naturally so, with conservation being one of our main pillars, I was right on board for Bahamar to support it and be a significant um, um, partner in this conference. Uh, while we're talking about Bahamar, though, and this aspect of it, um, because uh, of course, a lot of young people now are looking towards the environment as a means of making a living, right? Um, um, to be professionals in the environmental world. Um, how big are you starting off at, at Bahamar? How, how big is your team? And how big do you see it growing in the years to come? Well, the, the, the industry has certainly changed. The tides, um, pun intended, <laughs> has changed when it comes to marine biologists and students in the conservation field. Um, looking back, you would never thought that you would have such a senior position at a resort and conservation and environment and research playing such a significant role. So our team consists of animal husbandry specialists, our team consists of person that helps the foundation. Our team consists of aviarists. We will have birds. So it's, it's a very exciting time at the resort to promote conservation. Well, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. Now, um, of course, the first one was held in 2013. Correct. Right? Um, how much success have we had since then? Um, how effective have we been since Well, then? the conference has been growing. It was a huge success then, um, and it really established itself as being quite a world-class conference. And uh, just every conference from then has just grown and grown. And we, we tried, you know, this year we're really trying to grow and reach out to the general public a bit more by reducing those prices for people to be able to come in and see as many presentations as they want. Um, and we're really reaching out to the people as much as possible so that they're aware of it, um, getting the schedule out there so people can um, come and listen to aspects that they're interested in. And we've been hitting up all the schools, the high schools particularly, obviously. But I'm also this time looking to do a segment on one of the days which are just for the primary schools. So we got some primary schools interested and we were like, okay, this might be a little bit above their head. This is real research that people are talking about. Um, but we're looking at doing a, um, getting the sort of meet a scientist sort of um, segment so that the schools 
you know, as many people as possible can participate. And that's what you talk, you talk about real research, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, the Bahamas is really like one of the ideal places for environmental research Absolutely. in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm sure there are gonna be a lot of international, well-renowned scientists um, that are gonna be here working closely as they do often with Bahamian scientists like yourselves. Absolutely, mm -hmm. we're gonna have some uh, great people talking about iguana research from over the years to now. We have people who have been studying birds for almost 30 years in the country coming and speaking. Um, it's going to be really great. And then, of course, some new scientists as well who have recently discovered new species in the Bahamas um, also talking. So it's a big array of, you know, um, well-established scientists, some newer scientists coming in. Um, and there's going to be a lot of exciting topics. Uh, before we, I was going to ask uh, Vanessa something, but before we get there, you mentioned the rock iguanas. Mm -hmm. um, what are the populations like now? Are they increasing any? Because I, I think the last thing I saw, we were down to about 1,300. Um, what are the, the populations looking like now? That's a really good question, and it comes down to, uh, it depends on which population you're really refer referring to, mm -hmm. because um, all of our iguanas are really rare, and they're very unique to the Bahamas. Some of them are only found on the tiny little key that they exist on, mm -hmm. because unfortunately, when they were more wider spread, they got um, you know, uh, eaten most of the time by invasive species or even people, et cetera, et cetera. So they're now in such small numbers on tiny little keys scattered everywhere. Um, in some cases, their numbers are doing okay, particularly where humans are uh, not interfering with them too much. They're going, they're doing all right. But then there are some that have been severely impacted by all the hurricanes we've been having recently. So there's some research looking at that. Um, and then of course, we also have an invasive iguana that has started to uh, introduce itself, colonize different islands throughout the Bahamas. And what that means to our unique and special Bahamian iguanas is a very big question. So we do have some scientists coming talking about that issue particularly. Mm -hmm. One of the big themes that people are talking about also is climate change and how is climate change actually impacting all these species. So there's gonna be a talk on that and the iguanas. There's a lot of people are talking about climate change. Like I say, they'll be um, on the Bahama parrots and many other such unique um, Bahamian species. Conk? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Conk is a massive uh, focus point. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm glad you brought that up because um, uh, mm -hmm. BNT in Japan, right, the Bahamas mm -hmm. government in Japan, have just signed a major agreement regarding conservation. Huh? Exactly. That's correct. Mm -hmm. We're very fortunate that um, we've been successful with that proposal, and that's going to be a community-based um, managed project. But um, we also have, as part of this conference, a conch clinic, we're mm -hmm. calling it, we're going to have people presenting <coughs> on what they're working with in regards to conch. Exactly. Everyone's doing slightly different things, so we're bringing everyone up mm -hmm. to speed with a quick little talk. Um, and then we're going to sit together, put our heads together, and come up with what are those key things that we're going to ask the government to change in terms of policy, and then that will be drafted into a white paper going forward. But uh, Vanessa herself is going to be talking about conch, aren't you? Yeah, That's so great. not only are we sponsoring, we're also presenting. Uh -huh. So I'll be pushing the envelope a little bit. I am getting my PhD as well while working at Bahamar. And um, we're looking at presenting on the conch ranching as an alternative livelihood to fishing. So we're talking about sustainable livelihoods, alternative livelihoods. How do we combine the two and help restore conch populations? So you have to come to here and it will be presented as part of this conch clinic. And it's so critical when you think that the Bahamas is really one of the few places where you can get conch in the numbers that we get now, but you can't take it for granted, eh? Exactly, exactly. So we need to act soon. So you're bringing science and tourism together. Exactly. Baha um, uh, Very interesting um, also but you're also going to be branching out more into the community as well from the uh, areas you discussed with me at the beginning. Exactly, because under Bahama Resort Foundation and the foundation's three pillars, it's community, conservation, and culture. So we incorporate that in everything we do. Um, we are a significant supporter of Bahamas National Trust, not just this conference, but beyond with their educational programs 
and we're really doing things in the community as well. And it's interesting that you said we're introducing conservation into the tourism sector because one of my staff in our education program is truly unique. It's a badge earning program that's going to be akin to a Girl Scout, Boy Scout program. So when guests come on property, the younger kids can go around the property and earn conservation badges and learn about our unique Bahamian environment. They can get a conch badge, they can get a flamingo badge, you name it, they can get it. And we're gonna, it's gonna be a spinoff to the Discovery Club educational, world-renowned Discovery Club program at Bahamas National Trust. I mean, they'll even be able to earn a Bahamas National Trust badge. Oh, wow. So it's truly taking conservation. So you really might have people coming <laughs> to Bahama just for that. Yes. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, let's get to the conference now, mm -hmm. and um, it's from when to when? The 19th to the 22nd, is yes, it? Yes, the 19th of March to the 22nd. Um, it's going to be running every day during those days and there's going to be so much there are going to be three rooms one just with the scientific presentations and then the other two rooms are just full with all sorts of workshops like the conch clinic like many other sustainable fisheries workshops as well as the bonefish and tarpon trust the, the flat symposium as well as many others now, um, mm. from what you said it seems like almost anyone can come mm -hmm. but but say i'm just I have a little interest in what the Bahamas environment has to offer, but I have no scientific um, knowledge at all. Um, what is there to offer from the conference that won't get me so overwhelmed, <laughs> but, but, but still will get me um, uh, very interested and um, uh, excited about our environment? Well, I really think that people <coughs> should at least come out and give it a try because uh, a lot of the time on social media, I often see people s sharing things and saying, why aren't we doing this in the Bahamas? And my most common answer is, we are, but you need to come and learn about it. So the whole purpose of doing this conference is to be able to get that message out there of what wonderful research is going on in this incredible country of ours. So we have so many different unique species and so many talented people doing all sorts of things both internationally and, of course, nationally as well. Um, and you know, it's just $50 for people to just walk in for the entire conference. For the whole thing. Um, yes. Wow. Uh, so I really reduced those prices because I want to really get that push and try and see if we can get more Bahamians out there. Um, and then if they just want to come for a taster, just one day, they, or just if they're interested in just one little thing, they can come for $20 just for that day. Um, and they'll learn about wonderful things about how we're rebuilding our coral reefs, how we are looking at what new policy needs to happen, but also how we are tracking things like Nassau Grouper to find out um, what their populations are doing. Um, and I think it's good for people to learn about these things, particularly because everybody relies on our environment. Um, and it's just really important to be better informed. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, our time in this segment is running up, so mm -hmm. Vanessa, I'm gonna give it to you. Uh, tell us um, some more exciting things about your role as chief scientist and what's happening at Bahamar. Well, my role as chief scientist is a very exciting one. I mean, I get to participate in research. I get to inform a lot of the conservation messaging at the resort, get to interact with guests and connect guests to nature. Um, we have a lot of wonderful things in store and that, that ranges from coral to conch and it's just a wonderful and fascinating time and I'm happy to be a part of Bahama and the Bahama Resort Foundation and we have a lot that we want to do and support locally as it relates to conservation, community and culture. Well, great to see you and great having you, you on The Read Factor. <laughs> and uh, when we return, we're going to have someone from the Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. I bet you never heard about that before. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Welcome back. Shelley Cant Woodside of BNT is still with us, but joining us now is Justin Lewis, who is the Bahamas Initiative Manager of the Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. Welcome. Thank you. First of all, explain to um, those who may not know what the Bonefish and Tarpon Trust is. So the Bonefish and Tarpon Trust is an international conservation organization that's focused on the conservation of bonefish, tarpon, and permit around the world. 
Um, obviously, something very important here since the bonefish industry is very important. Yes, it is. Um, what is your role in uh, BNHC that's coming up um, next month? So this year we are a major sponsor of BNHC. This is our, our second time being a major sponsor of BNHC. And we found it extremely important to be a major sponsor because we found uh, BNHC gives a great platform uh, for scientists who are doing work around the Bahamas to talk about their research and for Bahamians who are interested in this uh, to come and learn about what's being done in the Bahamas on the environment environmental perspective. And um, let's talk a little bit about the things that Bahamians can look forward to participating in. Shelley? Sure. Um, there's going to be so many great talks, um, as usual, you know, and I'm excited about all of them, so it's difficult to pull out a couple, but um, we do have, you know, the Bahamian government is going to be, the forestry unit is going to be talking about the Bahamas Seed Bank, what they're planning to do with that. So, you know, most countries have a seed bank and they're talking about how the Bahamas is going to shape up in terms of that. Um, we do believe that there's a gentleman who's going to be talking about a newly, a recently newly discovered species of snake again in the Bahamas. So that's going to be so very like exciting. Two, two new snakes um, in uh, yes, species in a year. Exactly. In the, yeah, in the past couple of years. Um, there's someone who's going to be talking about a, a species of insect that was discovered in Eleuthera. Um, we have someone talking about land crab research. Are we eating too much land crab? We don't know, but we need people researching it. And um, it will be very interesting to hear her research on that. Um, of course, things like the Bahamian iguanas, um, the Bahama swallows, Bahama parrots, many things like that. Um, uh, there's tons of great research out there. I, I have to ask this, since we're talking about all these wonderful things that are happening, and of course, bonefish and tarpon being major um, uh, tourist attractions, but also very important to Bahamians as well, um, when you put it all together, how important is the Bahamas environmentally in the whole scheme of things? Uh, to me, it's extremely important. Of course, uh, we may be a little bit biased, but um, <laughs> the Bahamas sits on, on the edge of a hotspot, the Caribbean hotspot, biodiversity hotspot. We call these places around the world that have a, a large amount of different types of species hotspots, and the Bahamas is on the edge of it. And when you're on the edge, like the Bahamas and an archipelago stretch over such a distance, um, the chances of finding new species that are only found on these tiny little areas um, you know throughout the Bahamas are quite great so it's an exciting place to go and um, discover but also of course a great place for bonefish. So what kind of uh, research is the trust doing here as far as bonefish and tarpon? Now bonefish is the the more popular one here. Tarpon yes. not as much quite. Eh? Oh because we don't have the right habitat for tarpon we don't have as many tarpon as we do as they do in Florida but we have a lot of bonefish so like Shelley was saying we the Bahamas is, is a hot spot and for bonefish is probably the largest habitat for bonefish in the world. That's why we have so many. That's why it's so well known for bonefishing around the world. And so some of the research projects we got going on is we're trying to identify, overall just identify as many key bonefish habitat areas as possible. For example, spawning sites. If you don't have the spawning sites, you don't get new ones coming into the system. Uh, bonefish juvenile habitat, um, their home ranges. And then we've also been looking at larval transport. So once they spawn, where are they taken to? That's interesting. And also, where do they go when they go out in the deep, yes. right? Uh -huh. um, bonefish are doing some interesting things. We're doing tagging and stuff like that. Yes, yeah. Yeah, both uh, uh, passive tagging, where we're just putting dart tags in them, and they're doing acoustic tracking as well, so we can actively track them. Oh, that's great. Now, how large is your um, um, organization here in the Bahamas? Literally, it's just me, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, it's just me in the Bahamas, but we, we depend on collaboration, working with Bahamas National Trust, the Nature Conservancy, Friends of the Environment, a lot of other uh, local organizations. Mm -hmm. What else is coming up during this four-day conference? Well, we're going to be talking about sustainable financing for the environment. That's going to be a very important one, um, and we hope to get a lot of people out to that. I know the government officials are very interested in that. How are we going to make looking after the environment sustainable financially? Um, like we said, we're going to have a very big flats ecology symposia going on where there are going to be a lot of people talking about all the different research in, in the flats environment where bonefish are found, etc. You mentioned financing, but obviously you're going to talk about the economic impact, I'm sure, Absolutely. the environment yeah. has um, um, and how much it contributes to, to the Bahamas. Eh? Yes. And how much um, the environment is worth to all of us. You know, a lot of the time we try to put a dollar value to it because the environment really, I mean, how much is oxygen worth to you, for example? 
Um, <laughs> you know, uh, at the end of the day, um, it's really important for us to take care of the environment and to make sure that we can continue to take care of, of it. We need to make sure that we have finances in place. Um, and so that's going to be Im an important workshop for sure. But we have many other things. Of course, the forestry unit also has its own thing going on. We are finding a growing interest, though, as far as the average Bahamian is in conserving and protecting the environment. Eh? You see that? At, I at think all so. Of the work you do? Yes, absolutely. And so for the work that I do specifically, we include as many stakeholders as possible, both people who are actively a part of the fishery guides and anglers. Uh, lodges, and then um, just regular community members and making them more aware of how, how important the environment is to them. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, you want to run some? Because I think we are getting closer to the end of our segment, but um, uh, if you can I'll give you a chance to say some more things a about the A couple of other conference. things. So we also have, of course, the very popular student series um, coming back by popular demand. So that's where University of the Bahamas students get to present their research that they're being that, that they've been doing, and we have some prizes for them. So we've had some great sponsors who've come forward saying, we want to reward those students particularly. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're gonna have some students doing that. We have students, international students, well, Bahamians studying away, coming in to give their research, you know, wow. some master's students, etc. That's always really great to see Bahamians, not just going away and doing great things, but remembering their country, coming back to us and helping to spread what they have learned. Um, we have so many different topics. Fisheries, we have, it's a, a day and a half that we dedicate to fisheries. We're gonna be talking about conch, all sorts of things about conch. Of course, spiny lobster and their genetics and what they're doing and also what is the impact. So you know that uh, fishermen always use those um, Habitats, we call them, or traps. They're not really traps because the lobsters can come in and out. Right. Um, but they put structures underwater to allow the spiny lobsters to get in there, and it makes it really easy for fishermen to fish them. Um, does that have an impact, negative or positive, on the fishery? Questions like that are some of the, the things that are going to be discussed at this conference. Now, Justin, um, with um, uh, bonefish, it's catch and release, right? Yes, it's, it's primarily a catch and release fishery. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what, what other um, uh, aspects of the bonefish industry can you tell us that people might not know? Um, well, it's a, being a catch and release fishery is a sustainable resource. That's why it's really important to um, um, protect it. But then also there's the issue nowadays of there's not many people coming into the fishery, uh, participating in it, especially working at, at the guide level. Uh, most of the guides are, are a lot older, 35 and up. There's very few guides under the age of 30 coming in. Coming in. And so that's, it's becoming a, a, a dying profession, yeah, unfortunately. Um, uh, and how much skill is required? Obviously, it takes quite there, a bit. It, it, take, it takes a while. I'd say um, it takes at least three years to become a decent guide. Um, and it's actually a really well-paid job. It's seasonal, but it's well-paid. Um, for example, we did an economic study back in 2010, and we found that bone fishing contributes in excess of $141 million annually to the Bahamian economy. Wow. Yeah. So a young um, um, bonefish guide could make up to approximately anywhere from where? Um, On the I, low end, let's start. And, and so at, at the lower end, you're making 15, 20 a year, but some guides can make up to 60 a year, wow. thousand a dollar. Oh, so good living. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Now, um, we were talking about these wonderful seahorses that you find mm -hmm. in Sweeting's Key. I thought that you'd bring that up. Um, Sweeting's Pond. Sweeting's Pond, rather. Sweeting's Key is in Abaco, right? Yeah, sorry. Sweeting's Pond in Eleuthera. Mm -hmm. um, they're really um, quite a marvel, aren't they? They are. They're very unique and very special. So that's obviously a pond that um, used to be connected to the sea, and for whatever reason, it's now been closed off for quite some time, and all the organisms that are in there. There's a lot of sea creatures in there, an octopus, for example, but they've been separated from the sea for so long that they uh, are on their own path, adapting to this unique environment being detached from the, the sea. So it's all sort of like, uh, I don't know, maybe osmosis is the wrong word, right, from um, through the, the limestone? There's probably some connection. Because they say that the tide mm -hmm. um, lowers and, um, mm -hmm. and rises as well? Well, you know, we are a limestone nation. So limestone, I always tell students, think of it like Swiss cheese. It's got a lot of holes in it. So um, there'll be tiny little holes that the water is able to go in and out. Um, 
Everything's keys really in Grand Bahama. Grand Bahama. Right? Why, yeah. 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 Why you didn't correct me? You're from <laughs> Grand Bahama. I was waiting for Grand Bahama boy. <laughs> Go ahead, please. But the, uh, you know, what makes that pond really unique are the, the fact that there are so many seahorses in there. Mm -hmm. And the seahorses definitely look quite different from their um, closest relatives in the um, ocean. And they're trying to work out how different they really are. And also looking at the differences. So ones on one side of the pond actually are starting to become quite different from the ones on the other. Oh, wow. And this little micro environment difference uh, that's going on there, it's just really exciting. Um, and that will be eventually a really big tourism attraction, but how, we do how, need how to do, how do learn about it. View that now without actually disturbing that ecosystem. I mean, how, how do, do you, they learn yeah, about it? Yeah, I mean, no. How do they view it? How do they? Um, for example, if I went to the pond. Um, can I actually get into the pond in a, in a boat, or, or is that too disruptive? No, I mean, people are. Um, you can see it, on, unfortunately, on a lot of online things. We are a little concerned, basically, is what I'm getting at, because it's not, um, it has nobody protecting it right now, but the Bahamas National Trust is looking at including that in the next expansion of protected areas very soon. Um, so we're hoping to be able to give it some form of management and some sort of control, at least like if you're going to go in and see them, please do this and don't do that. But to be honest, we still have a lot to learn about those really incredible creatures before we could any, even inform such a plan. Justin, if you give me um, your final words before we end this segment, please. Um, um, everybody, they should come out to BNHC, um, especially on March the 20th, which is the, the flat sessions. There's going to be uh, 15 pre presentations about the flats, focus on bonefish, conch, uh, piping plovers, mangroves, everything that, that has to do with the flats. So if you're interested in it, come out and, and check it out. Wow. And that's only $50. Yes, for the for whole the, conference. Right, and it's $50. running from what time in the morning till when? Basically, pretty much from 9 until about 5. Some of them are going Daily? a bit later, almost to the 6 o'clock, but I'm trying to keep it within that sort of time. Wow, sounds really exciting. Wish you the best. I hope it's better than before. And I think I'm going to have to get myself there too. Well, Shelley so. Kant and Justin Lewis, thank you both thank for you being so on the Read Factor. Thank you. Um, and um, really, learn a little bit more about your country. Go to BNHC. After the break, we're going to give you the experiences of some young environmentalists. Stay with us. Well, if we're really going to ensure the sustainable development of our environment and our country, we need to make sure that young people are involved in every aspect of it. Well, the Bahamas Environmental Stewart Scholar Program does just that. It is sponsored by the Bahamas Reef Environment Educational Foundation, known as BRIEF. Joining me now, Mr. Alexio Brown, the Education Officer from BRIEF, and Alexis Saunders, who is one of the scholars who is working in BRIEF for the past few months. Welcome yes, to the Read Factor. Thank yes. you. Uh, thanks for having us. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what BRIEF is, sorry, about what BESS is overall, and a little bit about BRIEF too, for people who may not know, they should know by now. But. Yeah. So BRIEF is essentially an organization that um, their main mission is to promote the conservation of the Bahamian marine environment, which we all depend on. So this is something that uh, should resonate with all Bahamians because this is something, the marine environment is something that all Bahamians depend on, whether it's uh, for food, um, industry, or even culture um, as a whole. So this is something that, you know, BRIEF is one of those organizations that are really, is really essential for uh, preserving our way of life. Sure. Um, Good way to put it, actually. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and Alexis Saunders, uh, you've been working along with Mr. Brown and some others at Brief yes, for sir. a few months, huh? Yes, sir. What was that like? Well, it was, it was a really good experience. I enjoyed working with them. I enjoyed um, taking students out to Bonefish Pond and the sculpture garden that we have out by the Clifton Heritage Park. And with a bunch of other stuff that I've been doing, I have um, been diving a lot. I've been maintaining a coral propagation unit, which we use to grow coral because a lot of our coral is actually dead. So what we're doing is we're planting them onto trees, uh, like PVC trees, and when they get big enough, we cut them into pieces and plant them back out into the reef to ensure that 
we can regrow our reefs. All right, you're hoping to one day have a career in uh, the environment, huh? Yes, sir. Great. Um, this experience has just heightened that, or what? Yes, it has. Like, yeah. when I was younger, I wanted to do, like, shark studies. But now coming through the program, I've noticed that one of the things I enjoy doing is telling people about um, what we need to be, what needs to be done, and educating people on the environment. Mm. How'd you get the internship? Well, I applied. Um, one of my uh, good friends told me, like, hey, look, you should check out this program. And I was volunteering with Brief a lot. So uh, I applied for the program, and with the help of my mother pushing me, I got into the program. Good. Now, this is an annual event, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, for how many years has it been going on? So the um, Bahamas Environmental Institute Scholars Program has been going on for the past 10 years. Wow. And in those 10 years, we've actually inspired about 40 um, scholars. So it's, it has really made a great impact on, on some of the youth in the country, um, as we know. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't want to have a career in environmental um, uh, matters, it still gives you such a great appreciation for what we have here, doesn't it? Oh yes, it, it definitely does, because we've actually had scholars who, um, who've not actually went into the marine, um, marine or environmental fields, but they went into other fields. But the experience, the leadership skills that they gained from the program, they carried, carried with them into those other, um, those other um, careers. But do you find that the vast majority of people who actually go in it um, end up in environmental um, uh, jobs, even yes. if they <laughs> even if they didn't intend to originally? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, yes. I, I'm only asking because I know mm -hmm. of a young man who said he was going to be a doctor, but after I think he was in the first program mm -hmm. and uh, bye bye doctor, marine mm -hmm. biologist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, it's like once you get the taste of the marine environment, that's it. Like uh -huh. sometimes you just you know you just get totally sucked in. What's been the most special um, uh, aspect of the past four months for you? Now, of course, you're, you're getting ready to do another aspect of it. Yeah. What's been the most special aspect so far, other um, than taking kids out and, uh, and the diving, etc.? Well, I did a turtle tagging field trip where I. Sorry, what? Turtle tagging turtle field tagging. research, yes. Wow, where did that take place? So, uh, in Spanish Wells. Okay. So we lived out on the boat for about two, going on three weeks, and every day we would go out on a little speedboat and go out and try to catch turtles. And during that time, we caught about 61. Wow. Hey, wow. That's wow. Yep. And, and that's amazing, really, seeing them in their own environment. I've oh, had yeah. that, that, that good fortune, too, to just see a, a turtle come up when you're out in the middle of the water. And it really is exciting, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. um, did any work with dolphins? Um, not really any work with dolphins. I got an inter internship with Atlantis and their water features, and I got to stay at Dolphin Key for a day. But that's all my experience with dolphins. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us how important this has been for your whole, for your organization altogether. Yeah. So this is a program that um, that brief has been in collaboration with the um, the Island School for about ten years. So this is something that brief really saw was essential for raising the next generation of environmentally conscious um, citizens in the Bahamas. So this is something that we really see that um, we want to continue into the future and something that we really um, expect a lot a lot more um, a lot more productivity and a lot more um, environmental um, causes being pushed from from the scholars it's got to be a great way to recruit people too uh, for yeah. the future <laughs> <laughs> i believe alexis mm -hmm. wants a full-time job there now <laughs> um, but you mentioned the island school because there, there is a two-part um, um Two parts to the program, right? right. Um, going through um, uh, with, with, with Brief, mm -hmm. and then, um, uh, of course, going to the Island School, mm -hmm. which is where you head to next, right? Yes, sir. Um, when do you start that? I leave on March 4th. On March 4th, great. That's, and for people that don't know where the Island School is, it's in Cape Luther, right? Yes, sir. Um, and there are two people who are going, you and who else? And Christina Pyfrom. Great. Um, you both want to be um, uh, environmentalists? Yes. Mm -hmm. Different? Aspects? You, are you, well, are you sure what you want to do? Yet? I'm not sure, sure what I want to do. I'm not what do you sure want what to she do? does. Um, educate people. Mm -hmm. Like I want to ensure that they know what's happening in our environment, and so that they can spread the word and hopefully help me help the Bahamas. Oh, that's great. That's great. What's Christina thinking of? You know? I do not. Know. Not sure. Not <laughs> sure. Um, uh, so um, let's ask this now. You said you had about 40 people go through, mm -hmm. right? Um, and even if they're not environmentalists now mm -hmm. do they come and give back to brief 
Yes, yeah, so we do have some of the alumni that actually help out with the programs and also with like the volunteers. other. volunteers. Right, as volunteers and also with other um, environmental organizations as well. Um, for example, I'm, I'm a pretty good example of this because I was actually one of the first to go through the program 10 years ago. Wow. And along with um, Stanley Burnside, who's currently at the Island School as an educator. And it's, it's kind of full circle now. Um, the fact that I went through the program and then now um, back at Brief, try, um, you know, getting new generation of best scholars to, um, you know, do some incredible stuff in the environmental field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, from, the, from the program, I've been able to get a lot of opportunities to work on the, the marine environment um, project all around, the, um, all around the Bahamas, such as um, coastal ecology uh, with the University of Miami, also um, was involved in the um, the project called the Khalid bin Sultan um, Global Reef Expedition, um, so things like that. So going through this program like really opened the doors for me in terms of um, going into the environmental field. And it's an international exposure too. Huh? Yes, wow. definitely, and it looks really good on a resume, I must say. Uh -huh. Now um, I know that your colleague, who's going to come up with us in a few minutes, is just finishing the island school part, yes. right? And you've, I'm sure, you've spoken to him about what you might expect. Yeah. Um, what are you most excited about from what he's told you? Um, well, I'm excited for the four mile swim. Um, going to the island school, you either do a 13 mile run or a four mile swim. And I've been swimming most of my life. Okay. So I want to like try break one of the records that they have. I hear that. Now I'm a swimmer too, not a, not a long distance swimmer. I used to do some uh, marathons years ago, but, <laughs> but anyway. Um, <clears throat> what, um, uh, but, and this is for both of you, because you're, you're still really young people. What would you like to see going forward for um, the way we um, approach uh, the environment and what we want to do for the environment? What do you think, um, let's say if you could give me your top two um, uh, priorities for the environment moving forward. We'll start with you, Mr. Brown. Um, I think one of the first things that I actually want to see uh, moving forward is getting the public more involved and engrossed in the environmental um, issues that we have so that we get more public buy-in and also um, inform the public of what's actually going on because um, most times a lot of people don't really um, realize the, either sub the significance or the intricacies of some of the um, some of the problems that we have in the Bahamas so I would love to see a lot more um, involvement from the public mm -hmm. and I'd like and also like to see more data-driven um, policy um, decision-making so a lot of a lot of times uh, we have a, a deficiency in data in terms of um, when we make decisions, um, say in terms of um, creating new developments or going through with certain, um, certain projects. So we would like to have more data so we can actually make more informed decisions that would um, benefit everyone. Yes, uh, well, I'd like to see like more recycling and less garbage on our streets. Um, it does look really bad. There's a bunch of like garbage. And that's something everybody around. could help out yeah, with. Yeah, <laughs> everyone can help out with that. I'd like to see like recycling plants and like it, it would bring a lot of revenue and more, more jobs in as well. Uh, and you, you know, it shocks me how really, really way behind we are when yeah. it comes to recycling. Yeah, we it's are. It's scary. I found out something really scary. Yep. Yeah. And I'd also like to like put the Bahamas on like a renewable energy grid mm. instead of just having um, burning oil and p putting emissions out into the into the ozone layer. Mm -hmm. I'd like to use like solar energy, wind energy, maybe some um, some form of water energy, something like that, um, to help like reduce like paying bills in that kind of way, and also help the environment as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, I love the environment, but I'm not really good at science. How does that affect me being in the program from both well, of you? Um, well, I'll say that um, <coughs> even though you might not be as strong in science as, um, as you know, other people who are interested in, in the environmental field, it's definitely a program that's accommodating in terms of you don't have to have a strong you know, background in environment, but by the time you finish it, then you would have that, that background. And it's for people who um, are really, they really want a different experience and they really want to push themselves and, you know, go beyond their, um, their current limits. So I definitely encourage um, anybody who's interested in having a really unique experience to um, come through the program. And one last thing I would say is that a lot of people think you need to be able to swim or scuba dive to be in the program, which is 
not totally not necessary. We've had best scholars who actually came through the program, didn't know how to swim before. Um, we have one scholar um, alumni, Andrika Burroughs. She came, came to the island school, didn't know how to swim at all. Uh, but by the time she was finished, she was able to do the four mile swim. And I actually had a chance because I was actually at the island school working as a teacher at the time. Um, and I had her for a research where we study blue holes and we actually had her swimming in a blue hole. Oh, wow. So, you know, it's one thing to, you know, have people swim in the, in the ocean, but, you know, blue holes have this whole thing, you know, superstition and all that. So, you know, if you, if you really want to grow and, and see yourself improve as a leader, you need to come to this program. Talk about the leadership aspect for you, what, how it's made you a better leader. We've got um, a little, just a minute to go. Well, <clears throat> It helped me become a better leader because uh, I had to lead students out into the um, into the open ocean. They if they don't uh, listen to me, then it's uh, not going to work. So I showed them that I wanted to step up and look. Like, this is what needs to be done. And if you don't do it, then you have to sit back on the land. Mm -hmm. So if they didn't listen, I'd have to give them a little bit of punishment. But <laughs> <laughs> what would you tell students who want to apply? Um, I tell them don't hesitate like just jump right into it like there is no reason you should be hesitating to uh, come into the program it's a really good experience I enjoyed my four months day with brief and I'm excited to go to the island school and so we wish you all the best in that thank you Alexis yep, no for being on the read factor after the break we're gonna have his colleague who actually has just finished his time at the island school stay with us Well, joining us now is Jason Petty, who's also a best scholar, and he's just finished up his period at the Island School at Cape Luthera. Yes, Welcome, sir. and how was that? Uh, thank you for having me, and it was an amazing experience. Um, the Island School is unlike any other school. The community they cultivated there is really engaging, and all of the faculty and the teachers and everyone there that's there to see you through and protect you and teach you they're like really almost like your family in the short time that you're there what's the most significant thing you think you learned out of the experience there um the most significant thing i think i experienced was to be open-minded and to take every opportunity that's thrown at you and to not hesitate and overthink things because that was something I did a lot. That's interesting. So it sounds like you were a little bit hesitant about certain things when you're going in there. <laughs> and yeah, is that what you meant? Yes, it was. It was a new experience going away from home for three months, uh, spending all of my time in a dorm with 24 other guys from different parts of the world. Something new for me. So being open-minded was key to success in that program. Tell us about this four-mile swim. Where did it take place? <laughs> Well, actually, I didn't do the four miles so myself. You didn't? I chose the run, yeah. Okay, how many miles is that, the run? That's 13 miles, yeah. a half marathon. Yeah, I wouldn't have been doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but let's get to you now. Um, uh, this is a gap year program, I think you were saying, right? Yes. So people who um, um, finished high school mm -hmm. and um, may have an interest in the environment or not, but want to, don't want to go away right away or don't want to go into um, UB right away, mm -hmm. This is an ideal program for it, huh? Yes, uh, most definitely because, um, yeah, it is a one-year mentorship program. So, like, um, we have Alexis talk about his intern his paid internship at Brief. Um, that's one thing we forgot to mention was the paid intern, the paid part. Oh, okay. So, so you get it, you're going to save all of it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you, so um, you, get, um, you get money going while you're doing your internship, which is rare. Mm -hmm. And now you have the, the other part, which is the island school. Um, and that um, pretty much makes up the, the core of the program. Um, so it's a really good program in terms of um, also helping students to mature coming straight, out of, um, coming straight out of high school because one thing you probably might find if you go to CUB is that, you know, some lecturers might complain that students coming straight out of high school into, um, you know, the college. It can be quite an adjustment. Right. So, 
going to the island school and going through um, doing an internship through the best program can uh, actually help you to mature and really see things. Well, um, I, I believe that's light. exactly what Jason had said, right? That you, you, you've seen how you've matured during the period. I, I actually have. Um, the island school's mission statement is leadership affecting change and they really seek to bring out the true leader in you. A lot of their classes are student-led, so. What do you do on a, like a daily basis? Give me an average um, uh, kind of day there. Well, the rundown is uh, 6.15 is a wake up, and after that we get ready and we have something called Circle, and we basically give reverence to the country that the Island School is hosted in. So we sing the national anthem um, in front of a flagpole, and we go through a whole host of classes during the day whether it's marine ecology, your regular math or English, and 10.30 is lights out. And uh, it might seem early, but, but after a whole day like that, you will You can't wait to go to bed. <laughs> you're tired, yeah. you're exhausted. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, now, you want to have a career in the environment as well, huh? Yes. Now, did you always want to, or? I did, actually. After going through a whole list of possible careers, I finally figured out that I wanted to be in the marine science field. And, and your experience at Island um, uh, at School has strengthened that, that yes, desire? Yes, it basically cemented my desire to become a marine, become a marine ecologist. Oh, that's great. That's yes, great. Um, uh, what else can you tell us about this program that obviously um, has a great impact? Well, you said you went through it, right? So Yes, uh, and this was about 10 years ago. So. Um, Quite a lot has changed, but at the same time, like the core um, of the island school is pretty much still the same. Like um, one of the other key um, leadership aspects of what you learn from the island school is um, you have the opportunity to become leader uh, for the day. So it's called being the cacique, which is from the you know Arawak term for you know the leader, and the students um, vote for who is going to be the leader each day. And that person is responsible for pretty much leading um, some of the classes, um, leading students into um, into the different um, like lunch, dinner, um, that, those sort of sessions, and also collecting information uh, like about the resources that you're using. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a wonderful program. You're gonna really get a lot out of it. Um, it really guided me in my career path, going into the marine field, all those experiences and. Now, I have a bachelor's from the university, well, the College of Bahamas at that time. University and, of Bahamas. And now, um, now I'm finishing up a master's in natural resource and environmental management from the University of West Indies. Oh, that's going to be interesting. Yeah. That's going to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow, I tell you. Um, um, the, uh, we were talking earlier in the show about the Bahamas Natural History Conference, mm -hmm. all right? Um, you're going to go to it? Yes, sir. I think I will be assisting in that conference. Uh, I understand yes, you're presenting, huh? Yes, I am. I am presenting. I'm actually presenting on my master thesis um, that I actually did home. So after I um, spent a year and a half in Barbados, which is where the campus is, um, I came home and I am, and my research project looked at the effects of Hurricane Matthew on particularly the South Beach area. Okay. So um, essentially, my research looked at um, how much homes were. Um, damage and what was the degree of damage, um, flooding, and also the degree of um, damage to trees in the area, mm -hmm. and also looked at um, the state of the coastline and the um, the different threats of um, of the coastline, and also how much would it cost to rebuild homes in the area if, say, we had a devastating hurricane like Irma um, did to um, Barbuda. Um, and looking at, and I also give solutions or give suggestions into um, ways to mitigate against um, future storms for the area. Mm -hmm. And the project was particularly um, um, inspiring for me because I actually live in South Beach. So, oh, wow. yeah, so um, it was really something. Um, it's like, you know, this is a place it's where like I helping live. helping yourself, too. Right. <laughs> you know, the thing is, you know what I want to talk about as well, because mm -hmm. when people say, you know, working in the environment, some people still don't get it. But there are endless opportunities for careers in the environment, eh? Oh, yes. um, uh, I, uh, even within marine biology or marine ecology, there's, there's several ones you get. You can be an environmental reporter. Mm -hmm. There's so many different opportunities out of the environment that really 
you can make a good living out of, right? Okay, right, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, even um, some people might even consider like medicine, um, whether it's like um, natural herbal um, medicinal stuff. And you also have um, people who actually work as wilderness medics. So people who can, you know, patch you up when you're up um, three, five hours away from emergency services. So there's a lot of um, different fields that you can branch into within, um, within the environment. What do your friends say when you tell them about what you've done? <laughs> um, first of all, they can't believe that I went 100 days without my phone, which is a part of the island school. Oh, how did you manage with yes. that? After the first week or two, you get used you to it. it. You, you, did, you don't miss it, honestly. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it, it gives you a greater sense of discipline, huh? It, it does, as well as you get a chance to actually forge those bonds with the People. 50 other students from around the world. Um, that you will most likely be friends with after the island school, which I still um, communicate with friends from the island school because I didn't have my phone. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. that's really, really interesting. That's very important. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, very there's important. also no internet as well for, yeah. for the students. So, yeah, so you're totally, when you... And when you, you didn't die, did you? No, no, <laughs> no, you, you know, you, you ain't going to kill you. So... Um, you know, I didn't went, and it's pretty much the same thing when I went there as well. Like, no, no phone, no internet, no junk food on campus. So, when you're there, like, you really get a sense of like this is what they um, call place-based learning. So you learn all about your surroundings. And, and for me, when I went through the program, I actually um, gained a better, um, a greater sense of pride of, in being Bahamian because. Back then, um, like for example, like Bahamian music, a lot of young kids won't, um, you know, they don't really gravitate to Bahamian music because exactly. they're like, oh, you know, it, um, it's not, you know, like modern or mainstream. But when I went to the island school and, you know, these kids from all around the world and they heard it and they were like, yeah, I love this music, like, you know? I don't want to, you know, get mm -hmm. away from it, digress too much, but that's probably what it is. When we see other people appreciating our culture, then we start to appreciate it ourselves. Yes, exactly. It should be the other way around, yeah. shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say one more thing to you before I come back to um, uh, Jason. But um, you said that min natural resources and minerals, was it? Did you, did you mention? Um, um, oh, for, my, for your master's? Um, natural resource and environmental management. Okay, so and it was you, a you, specialty. Didn't, you didn't talk about focusing on minerals. Well, you, I, mean, I guess you could imagine why I'm asking you that, mm -hmm. right? Because right. everybody wants to know about aragonite, when right, I get right, my aragonite. Right. Mm -hmm. um, are you looking at um, doing studies in aragonite in the Bahamas? Um, currently, no, but it's actually funny that you mentioned that because I actually did a paper um, for one of my classes on aragonite mining in the Bahamas. Okay. And it's pretty interesting what I found in terms of um, the history of it in the Bahamas and um, what the environmental impacts of it would, would be and what's currently going on right now. Mm, very interesting. Look forward yes. to seeing your thesis. Um, so Jason, um, to wrap up for us, because we, we, we got, we're gonna just get a little bit from each of you. Um, I want you to say whatever you wanna say about your experience so far. Um, my experience has been one that I won't ever forget. It really impacted my life in multiple ways. I got over my fear of public speaking, which is something I, wouldn't say I got over it, but I'm, I feel more comfortable about doing it now. Hey, you're doing quite well. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, again, it just cemented my love for the ocean and my love now for the environment as a whole. So I wish that the um, more schools would implement marine science into their curriculum. Wonderful. A final quick word from you, please, um, Alexio. Oh, so for the BEST program, the Bahamas Environmental Stewards program, it's a one-year mentorship for students who are graduating high school and are interested in the environment in terms of marine, um, outdoors, or just looking for a brand new experience, um, you can come into the program. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the application process is closed right now, but people who, um, students who are in grade 11 and 10 um, keep okay, us in mind. For 2019, huh? Right, 2019. And, um, I would, so the eligibility requirements for the program is that students must have a um, 2.5 GPA or above, um, must be between the ages of 15 to 18, and al must also be either a Bahamian citizen, uh, a resident, or eligible for Bahamian citizenship. 
Great, wonderful. Listen, thank you so much for being thank on The you. Read Factor and sharing your experiences you. with us. And we'll be back with another edition of The Read Factor next week.